Good morning, everyone. We're going to be thinking about uh, the summer. And whilst I was preparing this week, I was thinking, yeah, um, this is going to be more of a faith-filled endeavour than perhaps I would have liked it to. But it's good to see that actually the weather is changing. We're seeing that kind of golden object in the, su- in the sky, otherwise known as the sun, beginning to make an appearance, and hopefully it will stick around uh, for the rest of the summer. But with that in mind, I thought I might open up with some uh, rather dad-esque jokes with a summer theme. So um, what did the ocean say to the beach? Nothing, it just waved. Why aren't lobsters generous? Because they're shellfish. Did you hear about the ice cream truck accident? It crashed on a rocky road. Where do boats go when they're sick? To the dock. What happens when an ice cream gets angry? Thank you very much, Pauline. You are on on fire this morning. Um, What happens when an ice cream gets angry? What what happens when an ice cream gets angry? It has a meltdown. Um, Why did the golfer bring two pairs of pants to the course? In case he got a hole in one. Anyway, some dad jokes on the summer theme. But that's what I want to think of, not about jokes necessarily, but about the summer. Uh, Phil is going to be speaking uh, next week, uh, finishing up his uh, series, looking at that particular part of the Old Testament, looking at the life of Elijah and Elisha. Uh, And then the following week, 28th of July, we're going to start our summer series. And so this morning, I just want us to prepare uh, and uh, think about the summer in readiness for that. Now, I'm aware that some of us uh, may not be tied in so closely to the rhythm of uh, the school year and how that affects how you take holiday. For some, the summer may already have started or may not start until later on in the year when, surprise, surprise, all the holidays are cheaper than when they're not the school summer holidays kicking in. Uh, Perhaps holidays may be an added expense this year and so some may not be able to afford or have to really kind of scale back on what you do for holiday. But wherever we find ourselves, I want to focus our attention on what the opportunity, the summertime, almost well over in fact, the halfway point of the year, what that summertime period can afford us. Generally, whether we're going to be going away or not, it's a time when we have the chance to slow down, recharge, take things at a slightly more leisurely place, with the hope that the sun might start, still be in the sky to make it feel a little bit more enjoyable. And so with that perspective in mind, I want us to consider some questions that ordinarily we might ask ourselves when we are preparing to go on holiday, but also, I think, twist to them, have a relevance to our life as disciples. Those questions being, where am I staying? What sites am I going to see? How long am I going to stay for? Where am I staying? What sites am I going to see? How long am I going to stay here? And the title for this morning is I wish you were here phrased as if it was God speaking to us. I wish you were here. God's heart for discipleship. Interestingly, that word um, or the word Christian is actually mentioned and used only three times in the New Testament. And yet the word disciple, or apprentice, is used 269 times. There's an awful lot more we can say about that. I'm not dismissing Christianity, the Christian faith. I'm sure the very fact that we're here this morning signifies that. But there's something significant there about the importance of discipleship and the word disciple. A disciple is one who learns instruction. And I think a great... uh, understanding of that word is using that term apprentice. It's a really helpful term because I think it conjures up a mode of education that's intentional, it's embodied, it's relational and practical. 
Um, and I know I've spoken previously about discipleship and how it's, it's rooted in the Jewish tradition. It's not necessarily something that Jesus invented or created. He was actually building on what was quite readily and, and, and um, easily recognized in the uh, times that Jesus was around and walking on the face of the earth. Apprenticeship and uh, being a, a follower of a rabbi was very common and they would have appreciated that. With that. And so therefore Jesus calling his followers to be more than followers, to, to be disciples, would have been very much in keeping with the norm of that time. And I'm not going to go over in detail about this, that this morning. We, we may revisit it after the summer as we take a closer, longer look at discipleship. But suffice it to say, what I want to bring to our attention is that true discipleship wasn't so much about acquiring knowledge and data as it was about gaining essential wisdom for living and absorbing it from those around us. For us as Jesus' disciples today, it means walking alongside him in a a mode of listening, of learning, observing, obedience and imitating the example of our master. The goal isn't so much to uh, acquire a degree in being a disciple for Jesus or passing the test. It's about mastering that art of living on God's good work by learning from Jesus how to make steady progress in the kingdom of God. Being with Jesus is a real key part of the rhythm of discipleship. We see in scripture in John chapter uh, 139, Jesus having invited Andrew and his friends to become Christian, uh, to become disciples, come follow me. He says, actually come see where, where, where I'm staying. Hang out with me, might be a modern vernacular way of saying it. He said, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day. Uh, Elsewhere in Luke 10 verse 39 uh, we read of Mary whose sister Martha was busying herself with the activity of preparing a meal and all the practicalities that go alongside that. Mary sat at Jesus' feet and spent time with him and devoted herself to being in his presence and listening on his every word. Mark 3, uh, 13 to 14, the 12 disciples have been chosen and Jesus goes up the mountain and summons those whom he himself wanted and they came to him and he appointed to the 12 so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach. And so that leads me to my first question this morning. Where am I staying? Where are you staying? You know, it's one of those key questions we ask ourselves. I'd like to go on holiday. Well, where are we going to stay? Literally, are we camping? Are we in a hotel? B&B? Are we roughing it? Where am I staying? But it has a direct influence and impact on what we're thinking about this morning in terms of discipleship. In those three passages, we read instances of abiding or being with Jesus. The night before Jesus was crucified and died, he made a promise to his apprentices, his disciples, in John 14. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper so that he may be with you forever. Another helper, in the original Greek, literally means another one of me, a helper or an intercessor. Jesus was saying the way to be with him is via the Holy Spirit. To be with the Holy Spirit is to be with Jesus. To be with Jesus is to be with the Father. There's that kind of flow of the inner life of God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But from that promise of him giving another, there comes a practice in the next, what we now recognise as the next chapter of John, John 15, where it says this, Jesus says, I'm the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you. Uh, I'm reading from the, the New American Standard Version, but it says, remain in me, other translation says, abide in me. And the Greek word there is this Greek word, mino, to remain or to stay or to dwell in. The encouragement here for us is to make our home in God's presence by the Spirit and never leave. And rather than think about that as being an ultra spiritual term or thing to think about. Actually, it's very common to us all. It's not a question. The real question for us today is not, are we abiding? 
and the call and the encouragement is not, no, abide, choose to abide, abide more. No, actually, the key question for us is what are we abiding in? Because we are all abiding in something. It's not something that we've got to start doing. We're abiding in something already. We're dwelling, we're resting in something. We all have a source that we're rooted or dwelling in. So what is it that you're actually abiding in? That's the question. What we abide in will determine the fruit of our lives, for good and for ill. So if we're abiding in the endless stream of social media, that will form you, likely into people that are restless, that are bored, that are fearful of missing out. FOMO, I'm sure we've all heard of it. They've got, they're, doing, they're doing this. They're able to do this. They're visiting that place. They're able to cook this. They've bought this car. I'm missing out. I must have the same. If we're abiding in national and world events, constantly engaged with news and the unfolding events and reading what this commentator or this pundit is saying is going to happen or isn't going to happen, we're probably going to result in dwelling in a place of distress, unease and a lack of peace. And so the list goes on. The key question for us is not that we've got to choose to start abiding, it's what are we abiding in recognizing it and saying, okay, are we happy to be here? Is this God's best? Where am I abiding in? To abide in him is going to be different for all of us, but it's going to have that common ground. It's going to be rooted and grounded in God. So often we might think about abiding to being almost kind of, kind of monastic living. We're all going to go up kind of a mountaintop and kind of disassociate ourselves and become isolated and kind of take up the life of a hermit or become a part of a monastic order. It's actually very much simpler than that. It's simply doing life with Jesus. Romans 12, verse 1, from the message transliteration, uh, some of us will be very familiar with, says it like this. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Put up on the screen, the Christian philosopher and teacher, Dallas Willard, calls what's this abiding stuff for? It's basically with God life. It's doing life with God. Dallas calls it, it's the with God life. Brother Lawrence, uh, from the 16th century, called it practicing the presence of God bit more long, longer than Dallas's definition, but I quite like Brother Lawrence's um, definition there because practice speaks of, a, of developing a skill or a rhythm of welcoming and being in the presence of God. And far from being a uh, part of a monastic order, up a mountain top, completely disassociated with everyone, Brother Lawrence was actually a dishwasher in a monastery in 16th century Paris. He's not sitting on top of a mountain, quiet, serene, cross-legged, thinking heavenly thoughts, and I'm just being abiding. I'm just abiding in the presence of God. He was actually in what formulated the book, Practicing the Presence of God, which is a great read if you want to delve into this further. He's saying actually, in the busy, noisy, mundane kitchen of the monastery, my aim, as Brother Lawrence was speaking to us, is to experience God in the midst of the chaos. And for us, it's practicing the presence of God when I'm trying to change Isaiah's nappy whilst also cooking for Tim and doing everything. That's it. It's not up a mountaintop. I'm abiding. I'm completely disconnected with the rest of the world, but I'm abiding. No, God actually says, I want you to do life with me and abide and be there doing life with God in the mess the mundane, the chaos of everyday life. Big quote coming up, but there's some here, that's why I want to give it. Dallas Willard, who is, as I say, Christian philosopher, teacher, but very much um, has given us an awful lot uh, of good insight and helpful, rich teaching in this whole area of discipleship, writes this. The first and most basic thing we can and must do is keep, keep God before our minds. This is the fundamental secret of caring for our souls. Our part in thus practicing the presence of God is to direct and redirect our minds constantly 
to him. In the early term of our practicing, we may be challenged by our burdensome habits of dwelling on things less than God. But these are habits, not the law of gravity, and can be broken. A new grace-filled habit will replace the former ones as we take intentional steps towards keeping God before us. Soon our minds will return to God as the needle of a compass constantly returns to the north. If God is the great longing of our souls, he will become the pole star of our inward beings. If nothing else, I love that last part. If, if our minds, as, uh, soon our minds will return as a needle of a compass constantly returns to the north. He's talking about God, turning God and our practicing of being with him into a habit. And though we, do have, we can create a mind that is fixed on God through the day. And like Willard's picture of a compass that constantly returns to the north, our minds constantly, continually return back to the Lord. And that leads me to my second question. So where am I staying? Secondly, what sights am I going to see? What sights am I going to see? On, t- on holiday, we typically engage in sightseeing trips, whether they're planned by somebody else or something that we, we choose to uh, go on ourselves, to various locations. We'll take time to take in the views here and we'll take time to gaze on the beauty of the architecture here or the, the scenery here. In terms of our discipleship and forming habits, it's important for us to think about what are we looking at? Scripture encourages us through the words of the psalmist, I have set the Lord always before me. The Apostle Paul writes, uh, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Apostle Paul writing to the book, to the church in Corinth that we now recognize as the letter, it's 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, he writes, we with unveiled faces looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. That phrase, looking as in a mirror, refers to contemplation. And that's, been, that's meant different things at different times in church history, but basically it means looking at God, looking at you in love. Again, it has that connotation of we've got to go up a mountaintop and be all kind of dissociated and serene and, and meditate and contemplate. It, it's just becoming still in it so much that we can actually gaze and behold the Lord, looking at him in love as he looks at us in love. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord. The Greek word here is katpitsio, to gaze or behold. To the degree that we do, do we do so, we are transformed into image. We become what we gaze at. With ever-increasing glory, that part means that we become more and more beautiful like Jesus and over time as we go through that process of, simply, of simple contemplation of looking at the Lord, to gazing upon his beauty, we are transformed into what we gaze upon. I say that because and we, and we become... Sorry. We become more, lo- more loving as we experience the love of God. And it's so true and perhaps one of the most painful truths today because I say that because increasingly greater numbers of people express something uh, of the challenge they feel of coming to terms with that when they've experienced less than perfect upbringings, less than loving parents and home situations. And that affects our ability to show and demonstrate that love to others, let alone ourselves. Do we, as church, have something to speak into this? Absolutely. No matter the pain and the hardship and the less than perfect human experiences that we've encountered, God is pure love. He's the perfect demonstration of what love is supposed to be. Encounter God. Spend time with him and you will experience his love and you will be transformed. Ephesians 6. Um, Ephesians 3 rather 16 to 19 I know Richard over the course of the last year or so has taken us through uh, the book of Ephesians so this should be reasonably familiar to us but it's a wonderful prayer that the Apostle Paul um, prays and writes to the church in Ephesus 
He says that I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen, strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know his love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. We can't just know about the love of God. We have to know the love of God. Know something about the love of God, sure, that's great. That, that's important to a degree. But we just can't know about it. We have to know the love of God, to experience it. If we are to be transformed the people, into the people of God, that God desires us to be. As Paul writes, it, it surpasses, it goes beyond knowledge. So to do this, we need to stop and look. This summer season, I encourage us to make time to stop and look. And as we do so, perhaps make adjustments to our lives so that beyond the summer, we continue to stop, look and practice the presence of Jesus. Now the Christian writer Rich Plass writes, Contemplative prayer is a willingness to enjoy and be present to God. It is a matter of being consciously aware of my presence in Christ and attentive to Christ's presence within me. It's saying yes to God with my whole being, but without words. In the Gospels, in Mark 1, we read that Jesus, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. In Luke 5, 16, we read again, and there were other um, more numerous examples, but two just to highlight here. In Luke's Gospel, in chapter 5, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus often, often withdrew to lonely places. The word here, the Greek word is eremos, the solitary place, the lonely or quiet place. For Jesus, the, the secret place wasn't just a fixed place that was the same place all the time. It was a practice. What's your secret place? I said before, very much for me, it's getting out in, in nature. It's going for a walk. Different walks that I have that I, I use around this area. But it's, it's getting out. It's being away from the familiarity of my work environment to being out in the country. That's a secret place for me. What, what's your practice? It could be actually, I can't, can't do two things at once. But I can't be walking and trying to be in the presence of Jesus. I need to actually be physically still. I need to slow myself down. Whatever it is, experiment, but find out what's your secret place. Part of us deeply desires God, and part of us, there will always be that kind of part of us that wants to resist and, and wants us to kind of rule over our own lives. I'm in charge. I've got to kind of slow down and surrender, and that's kind of a bit of a competing priority in our lives. We've got to recognize that and say, no, actually, I'm choosing to overcome that and desire and place my desire for God as, as priority number one. Excuses can easily slip in and stop us from making those choices. The, the awkward and challenging elephant in the room is that the majority of us have too much going on. And our lives to add Jesus into our schedules can be really difficult. We want to be with Jesus, but we don't have the time to pray. We want to grow into people of our into. We want to go into people of love, but our, our to-do lists are too long. We know rest is important and resting in God, but how can I when I still have X, Y, and Z to do? The hard reality is there's no simple way to follow in Jesus without unhurrying ourselves, unhurrying our lives, taking out things in order to focus on Jesus. The cry of service might be, I'm just too busy. Well, perhaps, and this is my main encouragement this morning, the summer season may allow us a bit more slack time to slow down, to stop, withdraw, to establish a bit of a rhythm of practicing the presence of God, finding our secret place. Which leads me to my third point. How long am I going to stay? So where are we staying? 
What am I going to go and see? Thirdly, how long am I going to stay? When we're planning and making the arrangements for taking holiday, we really take in what we're seeing and, what, and where we've chosen to stay. Well, there's a purpose. We've come here and I want to see what's around. And therefore, how long am I going to stay to, to enjoy what I'm seeing, to enjoy the surroundings, to enjoy the scenery? How long am I going to stay? For us as disciples, how long are we going to stay in God's presence? How are we going to stay and make and do life with the Lord? In part, it's influenced by slowing down. As disciples, we need to slow down. Psalm 23 says, and it's probably one of the the more readily recognisable psalms, Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I will not be in need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. Nothing speaks of slowing down than lying down. You can't really be moving if you're lying down. Nothing nothing speaks more of slowing down than lying down. And as we've been reminded this year through the well-being course, we are embodied creatures. We're whole people consisting of mind and body. So it's not just all about our minds and our brains, what we know, but our bodies as well. Slowing everything down to focus on Jesus. Being apprentices of Jesus is a whole person endeavour. Slowing down our bodies help us to slow down our souls to a place where they can truly taste and see that the Lord is good. A story is told of European missionaries that were serving in Africa uh, a century ago and they hired local villagers as porters to carry their supplies to their destination. The porters went at a very much slower pace than the missionaries desired. So after the first two days, they pushed them to go faster. On day three of the trek, the group went twice as far as day two and around the campfire that evening, the missionaries congratulated themselves for their leadership abilities. We, we're pushing them away, we're advancing, that's great. On day four, the workers would not budge, they would not move. What's wrong, asked the missionary. We can't go any further today, replied the village's spokesman. Why not? Everyone appears well. Yes, said the African, but we went so quickly yesterday that we must wait here for our souls to catch up with us is it time to let your soul catch up how can we maintain a habit of slowing down our modern ways of living are often empowered we'll debate that term perhaps at another time empowered or assisted by ever increasing technology and that can be a real asset but it can also be part of the problem that we experience in helping us to kind of drive us ever more faster Technology is an excellent servant, but a very poor master. Let's think about some of these, some, some some statistics around this. Just one in five Britons say they do not keep their phone in their bedroom at night. According to uh, a 2021 Ofcom survey, the amount of time people spend on their smartphones is increasing year by year. People in the UK check their smartphone on average every 12 minutes of the waking day. I've not checked to see if anyone has checked their phone whilst I've been speaking. Two in five adults look at their phone within five minutes of waking up. Uh, Two in five, yeah, Uh, look at the phone within five minutes of waking up. Digital media consumption, so let's put away reading of books and things like that, that. digital media consumption is expected to come on more than six hours of daily media time spent in the UK. Does that make for a recipe of disaster or love, joy, peace, contentment and peace? I'm not knocking any of those things in and of themselves, but when you think about just how much these little things consume of our time, what kind of impact is that happening on on our lives more widely? Experts recommend that our phones benefit from being switched off, to reset, to install updates to work better. I don't think I need to expand too much on that analogy to make it applicable to us. It speaks for itself. 
we also need time to reset. Within the last month, we've been looking at gifts of the Holy Spirit, and in particular, hearing God's voice. And we were looking at those opening verses of the book of Habakkuk, where we see in Scripture uh, some keys for hearing God's voice. We've seen that we need to still ourselves in God's presence, recognizing God's voice as a spontaneous flow within, and as a result, look to him to speak to us. It starts with becoming still. As people seeking to follow Jesus and doing life with him as his disciples, or apprentices, growing in maturity towards love, joy and peace, then our schedules and set of practices that make up our days and weeks and effectively what constitute our lives, these are things that will begin to be shaped as we spend time with Jesus to achieving that place of peace. We need to stop, look, and listen. Psalm 23, verse 2, encourages to say, He leads me beside still waters. Notice that God leads us not to standing waters which corrupt and gather the filth and the dirt, nor to the rapidly flowing waters, but He leads us to still, silent waters. And in the natural, we see value for that. Too fast running water is not good for sheep to drink from. If the water is moving too fast for the sheep, it causes indigestion. To be specifically, too much wind. If they drink water, water that moves too quickly, they need to drink and be refreshed from still waters. And in like manner, we need to be refreshed from still waters. In Luke uh, 3, verse 21 to 22, Jesus is baptised and the Holy Spirit de- descends upon him in bodily form like a dove. And scripture goes on to say in Luke 4, uh, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Jesus enters the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit. And yet after trial and testing, he's ready for ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. The wilderness or, or desert place was not a place of weakness, but a place of strength. And the word here for desert is eremos. It's that same word that we saw earlier, the place of solitude. The quiet place, in other words, was the starting place for ministry and mission for Jesus. And so it should be for us. We see this time and time again through Jesus' life. And just one example to cite this morning. It's in Mark chapter 1. There's a long chapter documenting Jesus' first day of ministry. It was a marathon of a day. There was teaching in the synagogue. There was healing Peter's mother-in-law over lunch. Further healings and deliverances. And by the end of it, Jesus must have been exhausted. And yet we read in verse 35 of Mark 1, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he left the house for a solitary place. We might have thought such a busy day would have been grounds for Jesus to have a bit of a lie in. A lazy start to a day to prepare him to allow him to be refreshed after such a busy day the day before. No, Jesus was up early to the quiet place. And reading through the Gospel accounts, we see that that was common practice, a regular rhythm to his life as opposed to a one-off event. A quiet, solitary place, but not an isolated place. And the difference between solitude and isolation is key. I remember conducting some research a couple of years back when we were looking at the care of the older person and how digital technology could be used to support them in later life. And lots of discussion took place around those terms isolation and solitude, almost as if they were, you could be used interchangeably. But representatives from those that were working in the care sector were quick to point out that many older people appreciate solitude, appreciate space and time to reflect, to think, recount happy memories, read, look at old photos. But they don't want to be isolated, detached and alone. You see, solitude speaks of engagement and safety. Isolation speaks of escape and danger. In solitude, we open ourselves up to God. In isolation, we make ourselves a target for the tempter. 
Solitude can be a time to set aside, to feed, to nourish our souls. We begin to crave isolation when we neglect those things. C.S. Lewis, famed for writing in Christian apologetics as much as for his Narnia series, wrote many books, including the screw tape letters. And this is a satirical fictional story used to address Christian theological issues, primarily those to do with temptation and resistance to it. And in it, Lewis has the demons rail against silence as a danger to the cause, that of ruining a Christian soul. The senior demon, Screwtape, calls the devil's realm a kingdom of noise. He claims that he will try and make the whole universe a noise in the end. Now, how very apt for us today when there's so much noise around us. Matthew 11, Jesus says, Jesus says to his disciples, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A, a yoke typically is a, a wooden cross piece that's fastened over the necks of two animals to allow them to plow a field or a cart, or plow a field or, or pull a cart in a straight line together. It can be something, in scripture we see it can be used as an example of something that can weigh us down and to restrict us. And we can always become stuck in our ways or get stuck in a set way. In contrast, in these verses, Jesus is saying actually God's, light, God's yoke, my, my, my yoke, is easy and light. It will do exactly that same thing, help to bring purpose, a uh, sense of direction to your life. But my yoke is easy and light. Rather than hinder you, it helps us to move forward. So, much like planning for a good holiday, my three questions for you today has been, well, where am I going to stay? What am I going to look at? What are the sites? How long am I going to stay there for? It will be great, and there's certainly opportunity for, for prayer now for us in response to that. But I really do want us to respond in a very practical way to those questions, to think about how the summer can be a summer of preparation, a summer of practicing the presence of Jesus. So keeping with the holiday theme, it doesn't happen so much. Maybe I'm showing my age with WhatsApp and technology nowadays. But when you used to go on holiday, you also used to send postcards to people. Wish you were here. Well, I've got a blank postcard. And Debbie's going to come around very shortly. Um, and what I'm going to ask you to do is take a blank postcard, and Debbie's going to provide you with a pen. And on your postcard, I'm going to write, I ask you to write a postcard to yourself, thinking about these questions. What am I, where am I staying? What, what are you abiding in? What changes could you make to allow you to abide more with God? What sights am I going to see? What could I do to set my things mind on things above? How can I establish more of a, a magnetic north in my life which brings me continually back to God? How long am I going to stay? What could I do to help me slow down and come to a place of rest in God? Be realistic. If time with God is really not happening for you at the moment, don't say, I'm going to spend the whole day, I'm going to go on retreat into deepest, darkest Suffolk, and I'm going to just put on sackcloth and walk around barefooted and kind of pray with God as I dance through the meadows. Look, be realistic. If ten minutes every day of just being quiet and just focusing on God is going to be a major game changer for you, think about doing that. What's going to be realistic but what's also going to be a healthy challenge for you today? Write those responses on your postcard. I'm now going to, then going to ask you to put it inside an envelope. Then you might think, well, normally you put the address on the postcard. But I don't want to see these. It's not about telling Matt what, thing, what you're hoping to do or telling other people what you do. This is for you personally. Write your responses on the postcard, put it in the envelope, seal the envelope, and put your address on the envelope. We're then going to collect those up and I'm then going to post these to you sometime later around August. So we're thinking about things today, 
planning for the future, and this is going to be a helpful little reminder, a bit of a provoke, perhaps, a bit later on, in the middle of the summer, what are we doing? Oh, yes, I said, back on the 14th of July, in response to what Matt was saying about developing, kind of, practicing being with God and making room for him in our lives and slowing down, I said that I'd do that. This is going to come, a postcard from the past to the future. How am I doing with that? Because this is more than just a nice little thing to have filled out 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. This is serious stuff. God wants us to grow. As we've seen earlier, and we're going to probably come back to it time and time again, God is not after converts, people changing their ways and becoming uh, believers. That is part of it. But he wants us to become disciples, apprentices, following his way, becoming like mini-Christs, imitating his kingdom values in our world. So as Debbie comes around, with you, comes around to you now with a postcard and pens, I'm going to ask Lizbeth just to put some instrumental music